Well, welcome everybody to California. I did want to apologize for the weather. Usually it's more perfect than it is today. <laughs> it's, it, it is slightly humid out there for, for us Californians. We do have a great panel here. Lynn has introduced them to you, so I won't do that again. But I do ask you to take a minute when you can to read each of the bios of these panelists, because the, for the topic that we're talking about, these are some preeminent specialists in this area who will have a lot to, uh, to offer. The role of the auditor is to provide trust and integrity to the capital markets, to protect investors. And risk assessment, the topic that we're talking about today, is critically important to planning and executing an effective audit. So back in 2010, the PCAOB issued eight risk assessment standards. At one time, those were effective in 2011. And, uh, and then a couple of years ago, in 2015, the PCAOB issued a report of the inspection results of the early years of the implementation of the risk assessment standards. And in there, they noticed they, they noted that, that auditors had changed the way they, they perform and document risk assessment, but they also noted some opportunities for improvement, including making sure that the auditor actually addresses the, the, the uh, risks that are identified uh, in, at the beginning of the audit, that the, that the documentation supports that and that, um, that they evaluate um, all of the results of the audit, including the impact on that risk assessment as we go along. Well, back in December at the AICPA SEC conference, Helen Munter, um, the Director of Inspections and Registration at the PCAOB in her speech, indicated that inspectors during this current inspection cycle would be focusing on how auditors developed their risk assessment and applied that in the audit at the financial statement assertion level. Now, I can assure you that the PCAOB has followed through on that notice from Helen, because we've seen that in virtually all of our inspections, and I expect the other firms have seen the same thing. There's been a real focus on the execution of risk assessment in planning and executing the audit. And as I said, that's so important to the audit because that sets the auditor off in the direction of what they're going to audit and where they're going to spend their time during the audit. So the objective of our panel today is to have a robust discussion around risk assessment. Uh, we'll talk about you know, what the auditor does to come up with the risk assessment. We'll talk about internal controls and how that impacts the risk assessment. We'll talk about some things that are coming up on the horizon and how they may impact risk assessment. And we'll also talk a bit about management and their role in developing their risk assessment and how that informs the auditor. But before we get into risk assessment specifically, uh, we live in, a, in kind of a crazy world, a wild world where you know, the, the geopolitical shifts in the last 12 or 18 months, um, maybe starting with Brexit or maybe right before that, up to today, have, have put us in a different world than we expected we would be in a year ago when we were sitting together. Um, there are lots of disruptive innovations, not just Uber and Airbnb, but um, blockchain and cryptocurrencies and those sorts of things that may change the way business is transacted in the future. Um, cybersecurity risks and active regulators, both here and abroad, uh, impact the risks that companies face. So Mark, I'm gonna throw the first question to you. As you've looked at your research, how has the, the current environment and that future look at risks impacted how management assesses risk for the company? Okay. Maybe to provide a little context, I'll describe a little of the work we're doing at NC State. Uh, about 14 years ago, we launched a we call it a center, even though it's not officially a center, but it's a research area focused thought center on the topic of enterprise risk management. And over that last 14 years, we've worked very closely with companies. So on the management side and how they're thinking about managing that complex web of risk. So our interactions have been, when I'm thinking about risk assessment now, I'm thinking about that management side to it. And we, we have a group of companies that partner with us, Coca-Cola, Home Depot, Lockheed Martin, very big companies. And it's interesting for me as I've interacted with them over that 10 or 14 year period, the challenges they're facing and how they think about managing risk at the enterprise level. I mean, they're clearly managing risk because they're up and running. So it's not that they're not managing risk, but they're realizing the reality of risk today that are affecting their business models is just getting incredibly complex. 
So over the last eight years, we've partnered with the AICPA where we've done surveys of a variety of things, but one of the questions we're always asking, and this is going to management side, is, and this is a perception question, so you can shoot holes in it, but it still gives you a read of what they're thinking. We ask them questions along the lines of, to what extent do you think the volume and complexity of risk has changed for your organization over, let's say, the last five years? Every year, they are way to the right on you know, picking the extreme. You know, it is extremely different in their minds, the volume, and then the complexity of those individual risks. Uh, other questions that we ask get into the questions of, to what extent have you, has your organization then experienced a significant operational surprise? Way to the right. Suggesting that it's getting harder and harder and there are events that occur. The other thing that we hear from them is they're self-assessing their level of maturity and how they think about risk is fairly immature. So there's, they're perceiving a gap, I guess. They're just saying, you know, these risks that we're facing, you mentioned several, cyber, obviously, mm -hmm. geopolitical, uh, just all the things that are affecting disruptive innovation, all of those individually, they're saying, are so hard to get our head around that cyber is very complex. But then when you start looking at the reality is these risks, as we like to say as we work with companies, risks don't know the company's org chart. Rather, they interact, they get messy, and they get muddled together, and they're realizing how hard it is to manage that. So, you know, when I look at the, the volume and the, the issues in the environment that they're facing, they're telling us it's getting really hard, but they're trying to invest a lot, lot more in it in better getting their arms around it. So I think all that, I think, is affecting how they're thinking about this. Uh, Maria, I'll come to you first, but, but for Philip and Elizabeth as well, from the auditor's point of view, how do you see the risks that face our clients and, and, and how do we use that information? What do you think about what Mark had to do? Or, uh, well, you, you saw me nodding. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's right. I think that the management teams are spending time perhaps even more time on their own risk assessment. And certainly we sit down with them as part of our process to understand the risk that can manifest themselves in an audit with the management team. And um, so we think about these risks and we have to assess how, if at all, they could be manifested in the business processes. You start with, well, how does the company make money, right? And you know these risks that we're talking about, how could that impact that? Mm -hmm. And then there's something to say about accountability as well from the management side, mm -hmm. who owns what happens with these risks. So um, I think more and more you're seeing us as a profession spending some time um, understanding management's process, which matters for their own, um, how they mitigate that risk, as well as if you go to what we do in terms of the financial statement audits, the ICFR audit, you know, we could really understand and leverage their process. And, and I suspect it gives us a lot better understanding of the business, which is really important in doing a right. risk assessment. Philip, any reactions to that? I think you're right, Dave, that it helps us understand the business context. It also is a bit of a leading indicator for me as to where audit professionals need to be invested as we go forward. Uh, the need for auditors to get out of the financial reporting department and into what's on management's mind. Uh, as Mark describes these survey questions, knowing that audit professionals will go and walk the corridors, understand the industry, the business environment and start asking. So how are you impacted by the geopolitical scenarios that your entity faces? What is the entity's understanding and response to disruptive innovation, technology deployment? Uh, whatever it is, these things may not have immediate transaction financial reporting implications. They invariably will have implications on how the company organizes itself, the extended enterprise, and inevitably will impact estimation and forward-looking mm -hmm. statements right. the company has to make. Elizabeth, anything to add to that? No, I would just say um, that it, I think, as, as Maria um, explained, as, as auditors, we have to become a lot more aware of not just our, our clients' business and operations, but we have to step outside and look at the industry and the disruption that they're facing, um, because it's not just about the internal sources that could impact the financial statement, but external pressures that they're facing. And um, in order to do that, we as auditors have to really become students of not just our clients, but their industry. 
Right, right. And industry focus has gotten to be so much more important over time. That's right. And, and if I might, Dave, I Philip? would just add to that. When you talk about relevance of our profession, being able to have professionals who can have this kind of dialogue and related to business and financial reporting risks, that drives value. That moves the audit outside of the financial accounting department and recording the results into something more insightful and more impactful Question. on business. Great, great One perspective. One last thing, we have to talk about it, but understanding who is disrupting their industry and how, and how they're thinking through that is pretty important as well, because sooner rather than later, they themselves will start to think about new revenue streams and things that you know, I mean, in banking, financial services, the fintechs, there, there is something there that we can start to think about and look, look yeah. towards. Well, that's interesting. You think about auditing projections. So, but we'll get to estimates later. That's what we're talking. <laughs> well, let's shift gears and let's start talking about risk assessment. And we'll start off with some of the basics. So, Maria, I'll start with you. So, how does an auditor do risk assessment? What's the process they go through? You know, just be practical with us. So, we started. Well, I'll start off and then you know, others can chime in, but um, the risk assessment needs to be as broad and holistic as, as you should give it time for. You, know, you started saying that um, you know, our regulators are focused on the risk assessment, and I believe that they should. We all know that, and I'll use an analogy since we're here in San Diego, like a good captain on a ship, you set course on a sail. And as you go through, you have to really think about where you end up. You'll have to self-correct and move around and you know, do th different things to get your risk assessment right. So the risk assessment for an auditor is the process of compiling a lot of different data points to determine at the end of the day how those risks could become a risk of material misstatement. Therefore, you should be spending time there coming up with an appropriate way to address those risks in your audit plan. And yeah, as I said, self-correcting the course as you go because things change throughout the audit cycle. Great. No, that's, that's great. It's interesting. Oh, uh, as you were saying that, I was thinking. I've had I thought you were going to say that my analogy was not good. No, no, it's, <laughs> good. it's very good. But sometimes I'll have conversations more at a local office level uh, about some of the work I'm doing with ERM, for example. And I'll get the pushback a little bit of, oh, those are business risk. I don't see the connection to the risk of material misstatement. And I think they quickly, sometimes in my conversation, I get the sense they're discounting the need to go too deep into that because they don't see it mapping to material misstatement. When I, to your point, I think it maps more than we're realizing and, sometimes. And I think, Mark, that, that probably is the challenge for auditors. Risk assessment is a disciplined set of audit procedures. Yeah. It's a systematic acquiring of knowledge in order to identify where concern lies and then respond to it. If audit engagement teams don't see a change in the response, they start to see risk assessment as a compliance exercise to be expedited, to check a box. And that probably is the biggest ongoing discussion I have with engagement teams, is if I do all this risk assessment, will the further audit procedures change? And how will they change? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Elizabeth, let, let me turn to you for a minute. And, um, could you give us, just a, walk us through at a high level what a risk assessment might look like in an area, the identification of a risk? How would you determine if it was significant or not? Um, sure. So I, I think, you know, as, as Philip was just explaining, there are a required set of risk assessment procedures that we all do as auditors, and it starts with just gathering uh, information from a variety of sources. So whether that's through inquiries of management and stakeholders, performing analytical procedures, um, uh, walking through the company's processes to understand sources of potential misstatement. All of those required procedures are, are done with the objective of gathering information on where risks might reside. And so for example, um, let's say we have a client who we start by reading an analyst report and we learn that their competitor has recently launched a product that's competing with our client's core product and has far surpassed the functionality of our clients. And then when we move into performing inquiries of management, we learn that they're scrambling to do research and development to develop a, a, com a competing product. And then we further learn in our inquiries that um, their distributors are having a hard time selling product at this point, and so they're asking for discounts and concessions, and they're asking to return their unsold product. And then when we move to our analytical procedures, we see that revenues are declining, cash flow is declining, inventory is building up. 
So we use all of that information to inform our risk assessment. And some examples might come from that of, you know, um, is inventory that's being built up now at a, at a facing a net realizable challenge where its carrying value is, is higher than it should be? Um, are, is there potential impairment of the company's goodwill or intangible or physical assets? Um, is there revenue recognition um, considerations associated with the distributor arrangements and estimates for discounts and, and sales returns? Um, perhaps there's a risk surrounding the company's debt covenant compliance based on the declines in cash flows. So, we then come up with that population of risks and we determine you know, what, what of those would result in a potential material misstatement. First by considering well, what's the type of misstatement that could arise. Um, could there be an overstatement of revenue or inventory or assets um, or an error in the presentation or disclosure of the debt instruments. And then we assess the likelihood of error that could come about and, and the potential magnitude of that error to assess you know, which of these is material and requires an audit response. And you mentioned analyst reports as one of those data points, and, and actually in your example, that was a very important data point. But I'd just be interested from the, for the auditors here, what other sorts of, of big data do you use, data outside the company's system of financial reporting in the risk assessment process? I, I think uh, the analyst report is clearly very helpful on companies that are surveyed. Any company operates in a context and auditors should be investing time in the deep business acumen piece. Uh, what are the industry norms? What are the non-entity specific research uh, materials available? What kind of trends are there? Uh, what are the underlying issues competitors have faced? These kind of data sources are objective to the company. What you don't want to do as an auditor is go to management and say, well, could you regurgitate everything you thought about and then I'll decide whether you did a good job with what you thought about. You, you want to build some kind of objective source of information for your mm -hmm. risk assessment. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I would say that's right. You have to bring your own objectivity to challenge management, right? Um, but I do think there's value in sitting down with management as well. If you think about investor relations and ask them what kind of questions they've been getting throughout the period. Um, you know, not just on the analyst calls, but you know, the, those people are very smart. They spend a lot of time, and why are you getting that question, right? right. And right. how are you thinking about it? And then you could take that and, and do work outside of IR and go to the CFO or go to the merchants and others. And so you're, you're constantly like just informing yourself of what's really happening in the industry and how does your client look relative to others. Yeah. Um, Philip, let me come to you. You know, when we when we perform a risk assessment, except in a in a first year audit, so that, that would be a different situation, we come to that with with prior knowledge. Right? We've been we've been the auditor for some period of time. The the team that's there was probably on the engagement last year. But there's risk in that. We talked about objectivity and skepticism are so important to risk assessment in, in doing that. But there's there's that anchoring bias where we'd say, well, Here's what we identified as a significant risk last year, and just you know, do do we carry it over, and do we do we sort of miss some risks maybe that um, that we should be identifying? What can we do? What do what do we do? I should say, what do we do to um, to challenge teams not to fall into that bias, but rather to to think objectively this year as opposed to you know use that prior knowledge, but try to think creatively. It's, it's a good challenge, Dave, to the auditor. Um, we bring our prior experiences, which is the first thing every one of us walks into any audit with. Sometimes those prior experiences cause us to infuse risk on entities that don't exist. I had a bad experience 15 years ago. Every single audit I go to for the next 15 years, I'm going to make sure we don't miss that thing. On the other hand, we also have the inverse. I've never seen a problem in this area. They've never made a mistake. There's never been an error. None of my clients have ever got this wrong. And that's the anchoring or confirmation yeah, yeah. bias that evidences itself. I think most research would say the only way to overcome those biases is through extremely deliberate, disciplined activity. Uh, sitting down and saying, what is new this year? Uh, what decisions that I make previously which would not hold true if something changed, the company adopted a new system, they implemented new accounting requirements, uh, they acquired new personnel, they moved the way they did the operation somewhere. 
what kind of conditional circumstances would change my conclusion, and then have extreme discipline in going through that a process before deciding that last year's risk assessment and this year's risk assessment looked the same. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, I, let me jump in there, because yeah, on the management side, what we're finding is they're struggling one, with optimism, mm -hmm. so they run into that bias of, mm -hmm. of course we're not gonna, we'll be able to navigate this. So, you know, the, the optimistic view of lack of failure. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we see them struggle with is really understanding the uncertainty of the risk. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll hear them almost state facts, or they're so vague, like the economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about the economy? is specifically going to impact this organization and getting that uncertainty, what may or may not occur, a lot of times they, they're too surface level, on the, again, on the management side, but if we're sort of paying attention to what they're doing, then that affects us too. So it's an interesting struggle. I mean, it's, it's a, a difficult judgment and we run into a lot of biases that we as humans all face and it, it's and, one that we have to get around. And I would guess, Mark, in your work with management, you're advising them more and more to go look for data points, Absolutely. underlying information and metrics that they can compare their judgments to so they don't get caught unawares by something that a careful discipline of looking at data would have avoided. Correct. There, well, there's, we, we always talk to them about the benefits of going through an explicit risk assessment process versus the implicit one that they'll say, of course we manage risk. Right. Right. Well, of course you do. But going through an activity to really focus, I think, can improve their, they will then say usually improves their assessment. Well, okay. and I, well oh, I go ahead, Maria. You know, Philip articulated so well. It's so important that exactly how he took us through how we should have this questioning mindset. As partners and senior members of the engagement team, the senior managers, that's exactly what they should be showing the others. Our profession is still very much an apprentice model, so others learn from us. And the more that you are questioning, right, um, the more they think these are the right things we should be doing as we're going about doing an audit. And when you sit down with management and you know that you just say, look, this is the world of what could happen, right, not what should or what you'll make happen, and let's just have this conversation, right, when you're talking about risk assessment or any other areas, I think they'll be more open to that because they, they do appreciate that that's part of what the audit brings, that professional skepticism. Mm -hmm. And Mark, to, to one of your points about management maybe identifying risks too vague, uh, and when you identify them very vague, you can't manage that. Exactly. Right? You certainly can't manage the economy, right? right. But if, you, if you're more specific about that, th then you can have a, a risk management plan to mm -hmm. address that. I've, I, I would think, and I'd be interested to hear what the other auditors say, I think as auditors, we've also learned that being vague in our risk assessment does not work to our benefit because it is, when we talked about those deficiencies, and we'll talk about them again in, in a bit, the deficiencies that we find in inspections, it's often because the, the risk that has been identified, the risk of material misstatement is too vague, so it's hard to show that then the audit procedures that were performed mm -hmm. really address the risk you identified. I don't know if you've seen that, Elizabeth, and, and how that's evolved over time. Yeah, no, I certainly agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Great. I, I think, okay. Dave, maybe a, a kind of a good example here. Um, when the auditors say things like, I'm worried about the impairment of goodwill, which is a risk you often see in an audit file, and they stop at that point, you're left with, well, okay, is that all of goodwill? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it every forecast? Is it every customer relationship? Is it every piece of data? And then you look at the auditor's response, and because the risk lack definition often more junior members of the team than interpret. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you questioning the work at the back end, the junior members of the team get frustrated because they make good faith attempts to interpret something that was too broad, do targeted responses. And then when others come in, they rightfully say, well, I don't understand why this amount of response dealt with that much risk. Right. And, great, and great you point. can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yes. I mean, if you said it was a <laughs> fit, <laughs> And this is the amount of response in the file. You can't then go, well, we really meant it was this big. Yeah. And yeah. That, it's yeah. like, can't do that. Yeah. So you have the problem. We, we can try not, that, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't work out well. <laughs> you're, not, you're, not, you're not instructing your people. They're not targeting the inquiries. They feel frustrated because audit partners send them back to do more work. 
and others when they question the auditor say, no, hang on a second, you can't take this big risk and now say it's like this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's follow on with that. Maria, this is for you. The, we, we were talking about biases and anchoring biases. Well, risk assessment, the, the primary bulk of risk assessment is done during the planning stage. But the audit is performed over the year that the, that the company is performing. You know, how do you see that bias uh, you know, in, in the audit as it moves along that we've anchored on our risk assessment, we stick with that, but versus you know, really relooking at that as things go on? Right. I think that um, more and more we know that, and you said we've anchored. I, I think we've set sail. Like, like get the anchor <laughs> yeah, out yeah, of the yeah, water yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and go off on your voyage. Um, and adjust as needed where we, where the more experienced professionals could bring, I think, the most value is in that constant reassessment and thinking about things, particularly because if you think about partners and, and the senior managers and engagement, we spend a lot of time, um, we're fortunate, talking to management and hearing different things or at industry conferences, et cetera, and we could bring that back, right? And we can help the team adjust. And if we adjust, the team executes really well, to your point, Philip. So um, I think more and more we understand that the risk assessment standards are not just there as a documentation exercise, they're not static. Um, we should be constantly thinking through that and making sure that at the end of the day, from a performance perspective, we've performed sufficient work to address the risks that we've documented in the file. Right. Anything you, anyone want to add about the iterative process of risk assessment? Yeah, no, I would say we like to use the analogy that it's not a straight road, that you just you start at the beginning and you keep driving straight to the finish. It involves a lot of roundabouts and you have to constantly, as events arise in the organization or as you learn more about a particular risk, circle back and make sure that you have properly defined that risk of material misstatement. I think this is all absolutely spot on. I've observed, though, that sometimes auditors are not deliberate in recasting their risk assessment frequently. And you see this when you get into the last five weeks of an audit, and something is now being spoken about, and you look and say, well, hang on, when could we have been aware of this? And hand on heart, you know, you could have been aware of this five months ago. But the audit had set sail, and mm -hmm. There wasn't a deliberate resetting happening, and now you're in that last period of the audit. Um, and I'll say this tongue in cheek, because it's, it's a bad quote, but it's fine. When I was young in my career, I had a partner who said to me, you know, the closer you get to the filing deadline, the larger the materiality you're willing to live with. There's this <laughs> image relationship. So there's, there's a lot to be said for deliberately resetting We, we are videotaping, Philip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. that's, okay. that's why I did say it was tongue in cheek. There, there is, there is certainly merit in deliberate resetting of risk assessment as, as, as a process, getting together and saying, what has changed? Let's make some fresh inquiries. Uh, where are we struggling because management's not being responsive? Uh, what has shifted that we didn't anticipate in March when we started out this audit. You know, on the management side, ahead. one of the things that, as they're assessing risk, so they think of likelihood and impact, but some are moving towards also scoring risk on velocity. So they're also trying to rank order their own risk, and this, again, is business risk. Mm -hmm. But to me, that seems like that could be potentially a source of information. Okay, management, which ones do you sense are very rapidly shifting on you? Those I want to pay attention to. Yeah your point about re revisiting. And that would get yeah. you out of the finance department because the people oh, with that information are unlikely to be in the controller's group. Very likely. That, you know, we, we talked about being, you know, being aware, objective, skeptical as you go through the audit to identify those additional risks. But what about a, a, a significant risk that you identified early on that as you get to November, December, and you're looking at what you're going to do, but how, how things have changed, maybe it's not a significant risk. Does that happen? And how do you, how do you document that in a way that's compelling to, to you know, the concurring review partner or an inspector? Who do you want to go with first? Oh, I mean, go ahead, I go for it, it yep. We could be monitoring a business that was recently acquired and performance has not been great and we've been talking you know we've been talking to the management team about you know this this is you should be cautious because you know you're depending on how the business performs you're getting closer and closer to to having to evaluate for any impairment and it could be right that the business starts to to improve that documentation it's fine if on the onset in the in the in the risk assessment at the beginning you said everything i just said but you need to be very very objective as well that what, what is changing, right? And actually, 
in, in some way even validating the changes, not just hearing and writing yeah, yeah. the changes. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think you have to be careful because it, it's very difficult, especially when it's a, a judgment area, a, an estimate area, to start mm -hmm. off and say, I think there's significant risks related to management's determination of the treatment, and then over time, you kind of say, well, maybe the significant risk is much smaller than I thought, it's more narrow, and then eventually you kind of get to the end, and you say, well, there's no significant risk left. That's a pretty, pretty important audit judgment. Uh, and to, to the outside view, being able to demonstrate that that wasn't an auditor falling into being rationalized away from a risk assessment or redirected or misdirected becomes really important because uh, you, you're making a shift in, ju in your audit judgment that's pretty big. Anything you wanted to add, Elizabeth, to that? No, I would say that um, I, I agree with everything that was said there. I think that, um, again, I think it's really important that you go back and always document the basis for your conclusions in, in those cases because it is, I think as Philip's saying, it's, it's such a substantial auditor judgment defining you know, which risks require the greatest audit response. And to the extent that changes, you know, you don't want to be caught, you know, trying to rationalize later right. why you didn't do as much right. to a significant risk. it matters risk. who is involved in that judgment mm -hmm. and who's documenting or reviewing how that gets documented. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. as a partner, I've always said, I know where it's worth my time to spend my time in the yeah. file. This would be one area where I'd like to spend some time in the Absolutely. file for going the other way. I think the same would go with the concurring review, the quality mm -hmm. control review. This would be the kind of judgment we saw. It may not explicitly say if you change from significant risk to no risk that the EQCR reviewer has to look at it. By golly, if I was the EQCR reviewer, I'm going to look at that very carefully yeah. because that breadcrumb trail is there and we wouldn't like to uh, be left with an audit that's short of work. Right, right. Elizabeth, let's move on and talk about internal controls. How, how does the our understanding uh, of an entity's internal co control system and processes impact risk assessment? Um, I actually think this is a pretty tricky um, area of risk assessment because I think that there's um, a tendency to give too much credit to internal controls when assessing risk. And I think a lot of times as we talk to engagement teams, you know, we'll, we'll see that they're giving inadvertent reliance to internal controls when assessing risks. And what we try to reinforce to them is that the assessment of your initial population of risks in the statement is based on inherent risk without regards to controls. And so, um, you know, we try to make sure that they're stepping out and not just saying things like, you know, the company has a handle on this area, so it's really not a risk, or they have strong controls in this area, or their accounting function has really knowledgeable people, they're going to get to the right answer, so it's not a material risk. And so we always enforce this message that you have to assess your population of risks based on the inherent risk qualitative and quantitative factors, like the nature of the account and the transactions and the complexity of the underlying accounting and the susceptibility to loss and so forth. And, and then based on that, you know, you assess that population of risk because if you don't do that, you could, you know, you could shrink your risk in unintentionally. Um, you know, with that said, internal controls do still play a role in risk assessment, and in particular, I think that when you're getting an understanding of the entity, you want to understand those higher level components of, of their um, internal control and um, framework. So, you know, those higher level coastal components of, of control environment, um, of their own risk assessment, of their systems of information and communication and their monitoring function all support the company's process level control activities and that's the foundation. And to the extent there's cracks in that foundation, you're likely to find a lot more risks of material misstatements. So we do assess those. Um, and then you know, after we have our population of risks, it's all about mapping control activities to sources of potential misstatement and understanding where you have deficiencies in control, where you can rely on controls to, um, to modify the nature and extent of your substantive procedures. Great, great. And we're going to come back to internal controls in a little bit as well. Um, Philip, the risk assessment, I've, we've said it over and over again, is incredibly important. It's, it's probably nowhere more important than it is in a group audit. Uh, and you know, many, many, many companies today operate in multiple locations around the, the world with different regulatory regimes that they're dealing with and that sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about how risk assessment is done in the group audit 
is it done at the group level, at the component level? How do you disaggregate or re-aggregate these risks to make sure that in the, when you get done, that you've done sufficient appropriate audit work to support the opinion? Yeah, and Dave, the, the interesting part of this is groups are not made the same. Mm. Uh, you can have a group audit where everything is on the same centralized accounting processes, the same centralized IT operations, the same controls being executed across the world, the same contract negotiation, back office, credit control, and that group audit risk assessment at the center will tell you very much about what the risk assessment looks like at the location. At the other extreme, and these extremes exist, uh, you could have a company that has 450 independent businesses in 450 locations in 65 different countries, um, each of which has their own accounting function, their own back office, their own contract negotiation, their own customer profile. Now in that extreme, to understand risk assessment at a group level is going to require the auditor to get into a lot of detail about how do things work at the location level. Clearly you can't go to 450 locations, so then you get into how do these locations get grouped and managed, um, what does management do, how can you understand them, do you cluster them, do you look at them based on geographic features, customer features, and get out to understand how those location risks in the second example might aggregate up. Because one argument is 450, each one's too small to matter. The other side of that is it doesn't take too many of the 450 to have a similar problem, and it matters very quickly. Right, right. Uh, and that's the tension the, the auditor has when a company is in a diverse business structure, highly decentralized, and lacks the kind of organized control environment that would allow you to form conclusions around risk assessment across the group. I, I would only add that um, audits of, of large multinational corporations, I think, are only getting more and more challenging in that, just like you've illustrated, the 450 different business units. Now they're also moving towards having third parties performing mm -hmm. some type, somewhere in the business process, there's a third party, yeah, whether absolutely. that's in payables and payroll, or the complete outsourcing of a back office accounting mm -hmm. function. Um, or aggregation of back office accounting. So my experience has been of, of late that, that the risk assessment process, because of how companies are now kind of managing what they do, um, is getting more and more complicated. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, <laughs> and maybe Mark, you can add something here, but the boundary between our audit entity clients and other businesses is smudging away rapidly. Um, a blockchain is an extreme example of what might eventually happen, but even today, the, 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 the going to a company and thinking you're going to deal with that company inside its boundary, that's rapidly disappearing. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah I mean, when you talk to entities about some of their big risk, the third party sort of relationship is almost on everyone's top 10, or at least top 20, because it's so integrated with so many other entities. Mark, let me turn to you, and, and, um, and we've touched a little bit on this uh, already, but um, give you a little bit more time to talk about this. You know, management has to go through a process of, of aggregating these risks, all of the risks, not just the financial reporting risks, right. but, but all of the risks. And what are, what are some of the challenges that they're facing, um, but how, does that, how can that help the auditor as management works through that? Okay. You know, as we started out, the, the complexity of risk today is, as we talked about the volume and the difficulty of getting your arms around it is just huge. And so they're challenged with just, it's a very difficult assessment. Particularly if we look at a large global entity where they're in, there's so many risks. And so you'll hear them sometimes say, well, we went through a risk identification process and we've got thousands of risks documented. And you're like, oh my, you know, how can you even yeah. start managing any? So part of it is the volume of managing the ones they're managing. I would say, though, before you even get there, there are entities. So you get maybe deeper into more middle market entities that I would say are still not really embracing the need to think about risk. Mm -hmm. There's that optimism thing coming back in. So a lot of, you know, you talk to some CEOs and they'll say, mm, we don't need to do that thing. We already know what our big risks are, which they know what a lot of them are. But part of the challenge, I think, going back to your question is 
so often we can quickly find and wallpaper this room in about 10 minutes if I'm thinking about a large global company, but often I'm documenting what I already know. And when I'm management, or more importantly, I'm on the board, <laughs> I'm worried about what is that I don't know that I should have known. And I think that's the challenge of getting people to think beyond what's sort of obvious, because there's so much that's obvious, I feel sort of good when I think about that. And so I think part of the challenge is figuring out a way to organize this complex sort of process of trying to identify the risk, but then prioritize the ones I really need focus on. Now, uh, they're, they're working hard to do it. Uh, there's a lot of pressure, particularly on the board. So the pressure for managing risk has really been sort of tagged at the board level from the New York Stock Exchange requirements, the SEC's disclosure issues, S&P is evaluating management and governance, so they're looking at boards. So boards feel the pressure, which then in turn puts it on the management side. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're working to improve what they're doing, uh, but they're still, I would say, at a fairly early stage of maturity of really having a robust system the leadership is interesting, though, because the New York Stock Exchange was sort of one of the first movers in sort of tagging the audit committee with responsibilities for, quote, discussing risk assessment and risk management. That means that a lot of times the person on the management level has been tagged to lead the process is the CFO or the director of internal audit. Now, one could argue that may not be the right positions, but that's commonly where it's residing. Right. But many now are creating management level risk committees that are meeting, that sort of provides that more enterprise view. And it's when those exist, to me, is a huge opportunity for the audit side to say, what is it that's being discussed at the management level risk committees? Because that's um, different groups of executives coming together, including the CFO, but beyond, let me find out what you are talking about. Because to me, if I'm going in and sort of assessing the risk assessment component of internal control, I think I'd like to understand how are they doing this, that risk management committee, for example, what are they talking about to give me some sense of the control environment, tone at the top, and how they think about risk, but then more explicitly gives me insight about the risk assessment process mm -hmm. of internal control. Now, let me ask you just a follow-up question there. This goes to something Maria said early on that um, disruption is impacting everybody and mm -hmm. presumably could impact our profession as well. As you work with uh, companies and see what they're doing in risk assessment, how are they working that, you know, how they might be disrupted into that risk assessment process? Well, it's interesting because a lot of times when companies first launch a process, we'll, we'll call it ERM, some don't like to use that term, but that concept of an enterprise view of their risk, unfortunately for many, when they get started, they see it more as a compliance thing. So they're more in operations, legal, and to financial reporting. But they're realizing the value for them would be connecting it to the strategy. Mm -hmm. And so when they start seeing, wait a minute, I got to take risk to make money. All right, let's talk about how we make money and let's go back and think about the risk. And doing so then helps open my eyes more to those external factors that could be, well, I sell this product. It makes a lot of money for me right now. What am I assuming? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming customer, customer preferences are not going to change or a competitor's not gonna dump some new technology. Right. I think it's when they start doing it from that lens, they begin to pick up some of those potential disruptors. And that's a great question, what am I assuming? You know, an auditor could ask themselves that mm -hmm. you know, right. at any given point in any given day, probably. Right. That's a great point. Well, I wanna talk about materiality and risk assessment. So Maria, I'll start with you, but I wanna hear from each of the auditors because Materiality, it's actually one of the risk assessment standards, so it's, it's part of risk assessment. It's, it's one of the most important judgments an auditor makes in, in designing and planning the audit. How to talk a little bit about how materiality impacts risk assessment in general. Sure, so, you know, materiality, we start, starting point, and we know it by the standard, is, is a quantitative measure. And so you start looking at a quantitative measure, usually around pre-tax. Um, and what you're trying to, remember we said risk of material, material misstatement, well, what's material? So we're still anchored in the materiality standard, quantitative, then you go to qualitative, that's also part of the standard, and from a qualitative perspective, a risk qualitatively could, could become a higher risk, right, or, or a lower risk, depending on all the factors that we've talked about. So I would say that materiality comes into play when you think about the quantitative and qualitative aspects of the type of risk that you're looking at. 
others to define? You know, I would say that um, when it comes to assessing materiality, it's generally easier to think about it when you're looking at the financial statements as a whole. But going back to what Philip was saying with respect to the complications introduced in a group audit, it becomes very challenging then when you're looking at a group audit that has business units all around the world. And you have to also, in addition to assessing materiality for the consolidated financial statements, but the tolerable misstatement that you're setting for each individual component where you're going to be gathering audit evidence. Um, because you know th that affects, in particular, an error that might arise in one location that might not be material, but if that same error is arising in multiple locations, it can aggregate to a material error. And so you have to know how low to go um, you know, while balancing you know, how efficient you have to be as an auditor to make sure that you're addressing that aggregation risk of errors yeah. adding up right. together to be material. And you have to think about each individual locations, quantitative and qualitative characteristics that might lead you to lower the tolerable misstatement for that location. Yeah, I, I agree completely with the description we've made so far. Materiality, I think, as we described quite rightly, is one of the most difficult, nuanced judgments one has. So the quantitative piece works well when the company's making regular profits and they're mm -hmm. behaving beautifully and you know the benchmarks all work out swimmingly works well when it's a single entity. As soon as these complications come in, we, we drift into a world where auditors have to make judgments with limited um, quantitative science behind them. Uh, limited research on how do you actually assign a dollar metric in a group audit or in a loss-making company where you no longer have net profit to look at. Uh, how do you go about making those assessments? There's very little comparison between what auditors' benchmarks give us and what some stakeholders seem to wish auditors would do. Mm -hmm. So there's always mm -hmm. this kind of distance where uh, if you take a very small percentage of net income, and I told you it was a billion dollars, some stakeholders would look and say, we can't understand how you would pass on a billion dollars of risk in the financial statements, right. and then we get into this realm of auditors mm -hmm. explaining it's a reasonable but not absolute assurance. And yeah. So th there are definitely complexities in materiality when things aren't easy and when entities get incredibly large. Mm -hmm. right. I would say you know, one other thing that could be complicated when assessing materiality is we, we establish that early on in the year because we need to use that materiality measurement to, to scope our audit and which locations we're going to, which accounts we have to address, and so forth. And so that, that figure is often based on a projection that management has, whether it be revenue or, or profit. And, and so we have to not only assess what that appropriate materiality number is, but whether we can rely on that projection. And, and so that also involves you know, assessing management's effectiveness of setting projections and how accurate they've been in the past, because what we don't want to run into is you know, down the road when they're missing projections, having to lower our materiality and then start our risk assessment over again and potentially expand the audit work we've right, done to date right. late in the audit. Well, I think we can all certainly agree that materiality is incredibly important and the FASB has shown us that it's also difficult to figure out how to address it from an accounting perspective. I think the one thing too, going back to management, I go back to Mark on this, but at the end of the day, we, will, we have this expectation gap outside stakeholders in terms of what they believe an auditor does, right, in terms of re our reasonable assurance on the financial statements taken as a whole. But as, as auditors, we do have to make sure that the audit committee and the management team understands what Elizabeth just said happens, depending on what happens in their own business, to how we plan and go about the risk assessment and all these other things. So the knock-on effects, right, because we have to reevaluate our materiality like the risk assessment throughout the course of the audit, mm -hmm. right? Well, that's a great point and a great transition because we're going to start talking about communications. First, Maria, okay. I'll go to you with, uh, with audit committees. But the, the, um, there's a requirement that we discuss significant risks with the audit committee. And, and certainly of late, that's become even more important with the new auditor's reporting model standard that, that has been issued and, and um, uh, you know, may become a basis for CAMs and that sort of thing. So I, I wanted to get some, just from, from your, experience, your personal experience, but also anecdotally, uh, how do those discussions go? Are there situations where the audit committee he listens to the significant risks and questions why would you think that was a significant risk or does it resonate with them? 
more often than not, the audit committees understand the business well enough and have spent enough time with management that when we're having the discussion around what's a significant risk and why, it, they understand it and it resonates in, in my own experience. Um, certainly if there's, if there's any disconnect, it could be because of something that would come up later in the audit cycle that, that neither the management team, perhaps we haven't, spent enough time discussing. But um, mo most of the, all the parties involved c come to agreement on significant risk, okay. I would say. Um, uh, Philip, what, we have those same discussions with management, obviously, before we go in and talk to the, the audit committee. Do, how do those discussions go? And, and that, to me, seems like a, a, I guess either of those uh, discussions could be, but that discussion with management might be a great place to find out if we've understated the risks, too. Do we ever, do we ever find that? I, I think one does in an audit. Audits are tricky beasts, because every time we ask a question like this, if I bookend at extremes, you've got the well-controlled, stable business with a great enterprise risk management approach, with a good inventory, they've been very objective, there's something to compare against, the business is run well and doing well. In those discussions, your management is often very keen on the auditor bringing some challenge mm -hmm. and some new perspective, and they are willing to add to their understanding. On the other hand, if you've got a business that is less well-run, uh, where perhaps management and the audit committee view the audit as a bit of a nuisance. Mm -hmm. um, the company might not be doing as well or there might be more issues. Those discussions are a lot harder to have because uh, you may not have an open audience. The, yeah. the management team might be looking and saying, oh no, that's not really a risk. You don't understand business. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've never lived my side of this discussion. Uh, we've never had a problem in that area. I don't know what you're going on about. I can't have you go to the audit committee and say that's something that's concerning to you because really it shouldn't be. So that's, that's the kind of yeah. separation auditors face between this discussion and in, in, in what I call the ideal audit scenario and the not ideal audit mm -hmm. scenario. And mm -hmm. each of those brings a, a different level of, of need for the auditor to be tenacious, um, to stand their ground, uh, and to make sure the right conversations end up happening with the audit committee. Let me, let me just ask another question. Anybody, Elizabeth, maybe I'll ask you this, but the, anybody could answer this. Certainly the, the company and their 10K is disclosing a lot of risks. Uh, some of them probably look like every one of their competitors and are worded almost exactly the same. But to what extent did those risks, the ones that they've talked publicly about, inform our risk assessment? Well, I think they certainly do. I think, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about always wanting to take a, a fresh perspective and not be anchored. And I think a lot of those risks just kind of get carried forward in the 10K over and over. And so I think it's incumbent on both management and the auditor to always challenge, you know, what has been disclosed and does it still make sense? Are there new risks that we should be adding? Are these truly, you know, still risks that need to be disclosed? Because when you disclose so much, it kind of, it then you know drags the importance of the true risks down to this you know minutia. Mm -hmm. So we certainly do um, reconcile what we view as, in particular, our significant risks that right. require special audit consideration, um, with the critical accounting policies that the company has disclosed, which reflect you know the areas where there's a greatest risk of material misstatement. I think uh, well said. I, I would say for an auditor it would be dangerous to discount what management have declared to be their own most important risks. So even if the auditor looks and says, hey, I don't know, you guys are really over-engineering your risk assessment, it would be dangerous for that auditor to say, well, and I'm not going to have a further audit response. I know more than you do. Right. right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, Maria, let me come to you and, and ask this question. As we've looked at, at how, talk about disruption and how things are changing and transforming in the audit world, data analytics and, and uses of, of technologies in performing the audit has certainly been a big subject of discussion and application over the last couple of years. How, has, how is data analytics and, and that analysis of bigger data impacting risk assessment today? So I think it's helpful, right? Data can inform um, our risk assessment no different than all the other sources we've talked about outside the company or that management does. So one example um, would be that whereas you would use some type of uh, data analytics visualization um, at a period end to look at um, journal entries, let's keep it simple, you could actually run those same reports and analyze the data and what it's telling you as part of the risk assessment process. 
to validate whether everything you think and heard about a business process mm -hmm. and the risk actually are in fact occurring just by looking at journal entries. So, mm -hmm. so it's been helpful um, because these visualization tools, and again, we, we first um, in our firm, I know others are using them as well, started using them for the journal entry type work that we would do to address the risk of fraud, et cetera. Now we can bring that forward to the risk assessment. Yeah. Uh, Any other experience you uh, want to share? I think one that's resonated with me is different to our traditional data analytics that look at transaction records where there's a lot of benefit. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of work that's been done on surveying outside data. And I'll give a, a real crisp example. If you go look across a social media platform, uh, you can quickly pick up customer complaint trends. Mm -hmm. uh, the outside community has got to the point where if you wanted to know is there an unaccounted for or unrecognized product warranty issue or airline service delivery issue, you're not constrained to the boundary of your client. And uh, I've seen some, some work done where you, you survey all of the Twitter, Facebook um, type feeds, Instagram more lately, that have hashtag associated with your clients. And I've seen spots where auditors have been able to say, well, looking at what you got here, there's a boundary issue. You've got a service delivery issue in a geography. You've got a product issue emerging over here. And clearly, we've got to get some more facts, but we actually can't, we're then not ignoring what is obviously in front of us. Right. Great, great. Mark, talk to us a little bit, since we're here at the AAA conference, talk to us a little bit about how risk assessment is impacting research that's being done, has been done, or is being done today, and, and what are academics thinking about risk assessment? Well, the risk assessment area, I've got a lot of colleagues in here who have done work in this space. So I would say this is an area that has definitely drawn attention uh, to researchers over the years. One of the first uh, PCOB synthesis projects was looking at the literature on risk assessment, and that came out, I think, in 2006. So probably time to update that a little bit. But clearly there's been a lot of work across a lot of different dimensions of looking at, one, to, to what extent are auditors effectively picking up on risk indicator, risk factors that could suggest there are risks both inherent and then the control risk side of things. Uh, so finding that you know we're, we see some evidence that generally speaking, picking up on that, but the challenge then is mapping that to the response as you were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of noise there if you look across the studies of how well they are adjusting the response side. Uh, then there's been work that's been more focused on the fraud risk assessment piece, particularly the, the brainstorming elements that came about, I guess, when SAS 99 was mm -hmm. issued, issued initially, but more specifically looking at the benefits of explicitly thinking about fraud risk and how does that impact auditor identification of factors. Challenges, though, that came out of that research are we, we struggle to sort of weight factors when I'm looking at lots of them, which ones are the more important ones. Other research looking at the role of decision aids and artificial intelligence and things like that. So there's a lot of work when you get into risk assessment that's been done. Moving to where we're talking about today in my hat again as I keep beating the management side is where I see opportunity is, opportunities for more research is more uh, understanding more the interaction of what we've been talking about. Of, okay, management's investing a lot more in how they think about risk how are auditors really leveraging that? And then what are the benefits of that? What are some of the distractors? You know, let's, we're sort of saying, I ought to be thinking about that, but maybe research needs to look at how difficult that might be and what are some of the pitfalls mm -hmm. that when I begin to think about management's risk and risk assessment processes to then do my own risk and material misstatement, what are some of the things that we need to understand better there? Um, and then more specifically, I think in our research, uh, I mean, I've done work in the control environment. So you think of boards and audit committees. There's been quite a bit of work in that space. And then there's been a lot of work more specific on you know, internal controls. So I'm sort of thinking control activities. But it seems to me our research has sort of skipped over the risk assessment component of internal control, where I don't know that there's a lot on that piece of the control components mm -hmm. of the five in the internal control framework yeah. that I think there's opportunity there uh, to, to explore that further. And, and so I, I think there's a lot of room as we start looking at the complexity of risk assessment today, 
just do data analytics. You know, how could data analytics be informative to a risk assessment process? Right. So there's yeah. a lot of room for research. One, one thing that would be helpful is audit committees in their role could spend time with management saying, here's our risk assessment process, very robust. We also have a responsibility as a company, this is you know, audit committee chair, in terms of our internal controls or financial reporting, right, having the right set of controls that are preventive, detective, all these kinds of things. How does this process around your risk assessment ever translate to maybe adjustments mm -hmm. on this other process? Mm -hmm. right. Not. <laughs> so, yeah. and maybe, you know, as long as they're thinking about making, because we certainly do in the profession, but it's always helpful uh, if management is thinking about that as well, and audit committee chairs uh, from where they sit can, can certainly ask those very, those questions that would, you know, get, get that started. Great, great. Uh, Dave, oh, if, oh, go ahead, Phyllis. If, 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 I, if I could, um, I think your question was around what research we could benefit from, and, and I, I keep coming back to the biggest struggle I see auditors have is once I've done all of this thoughtful risk assessment, I spent hundreds of hours of expensive time, and we've gathered all this information, and you put it well, Mark, how do I change the audit response? Mm -hmm. And that's probably the piece that is to my mind the gap that makes risk assessment hard for auditors, young in their career particularly, to embrace and get excited about. Because I say, okay, so we're gonna do all of this. And at the end of my full brainstorming discussion, at the end of all of this work, will I end up looking at the same controls? And will the further substantive procedures be the same as they would have been otherwise? Then you start losing attention, because the professionals start saying, well, hang on a second. And, and I'm sure there's something I haven't identified, so I admit that. It's very hard to find examples of genuine change in the nature of the audit response. There's plenty about how much, but, but not as much about the nature. Yeah, and that's what some of the research shows, that we might adjust sample sizes, mm -hmm. but we don't change the procedure, yeah. and that yep. has yep. come out with some studies. Elizabeth, from, from the profession's perspective, what would be, what's a message we'd want to give to, to the academics who are here about what they should be conveying to their students about risk assessment? Well, I think, um, you know, it's, it's pulling in a lot of the things that we've already talked about, but from my perspective, it's translating, you know, the infinite amount of operational and business risks into risks that can impact the financial statements. And we talked about, you know, you don't want to, to limit yourself in the identification of those risks, but you also have to make sure that when you hear about those risks as you're talking to management and stakeholders, that you know how to translate them into, you know, where our responsibility lies, which is when it manifests itself into a misstatement in the historical financial statements. Um, and that, that takes a lot of auditor skill and judgment to hone in from, you know, the pool of, of of risks into those that require an audit response, mm -hmm. and, and and you know Philip just went into this. We you know I think when you lose that attention about how valuable the identification of a risk and how we respond to it is, then it, it's hard to make that connection. So you have to make sure that you're educating early on to develop that skill, um, so that as auditors we are appropriately focused and we're not limiting ourselves into the risks that require response and and how we need to respond. Well, let's, we're going to shift gears here a little bit, talk about uh, documentation, but documentation then ultimately leads to sometimes deficiencies when, when internal or external inspections happen. So Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you here. Okay. We've talked a lot about risk assessment and, and how we define what those risks are, those significant risks, but what about the, the part of risk assessment where we conclude that there isn't a reasonable risk of a material misstatement. So the risk assessment procedure may be the only procedure we perform around that, you know, mm -hmm. account balance or class of transactions or something. How much documentation do we need to put in the file to support that professional judgment and, and is, it, is it clear to the auditor what they need to document in that circumstance? I think this is a really excellent question, and I would say that it's something that it's a balancing act that we spend more and more attention to debating um, as time goes by. Um, because, um, as I mentioned just now, there, there are an infinite amount of risks that one can consider when assessing, you know, risks to an organization, but we as auditors, you know, have to hone in on those risks that can manifest itself into the financial statements. So we do have a lot of debates about this, and the you know the 
the, the, the fact of the matter is we aren't just responsible for our risk assessment conclusions, you know, that ultimately we have risks that we've responded to appropriately, but on our process for getting to those conclusions and the basis for our judgment of saying, you know, why and how we decided a particular risk did not require an audit response. So, um, you know, we're continuing to emphasize to teams the areas in which that this is important because, you know, some areas are, are pretty clear cut and dry where it's a little bit obvious, you know, cash or payables or expenses. It, it, it didn't take a lot of auditor judgment to conclude here are my risks of material misstatement. But naturally, there are other areas where a lot of careful consideration is needed, you know, whether that's over revenue or inventory or if you're a bank on the allowance for loan and lease losses. Um, you know, a significant unusual transaction like a business combination, those naturally involve more auditor judgment for defining what your risks are that have a risk of material misstatement, and you have to do a good job of explaining in your audit documentation when you decided something wasn't a risk that required a response. So we always say, you know, document all your close calls. You know, anything that you as a team spent time with and you ultimately decided that risk does not require a response. Um, you know, whether that's a risk that's inherent to the industry or the account, and you say ultimately that risk doesn't impact this particular client, you know, go ahead and document the other basis for that conclusion. Great. Anybody want to add to that? I would just that? say oftentimes when, when teams go through risk assessment, they, they get to, to low risk, maybe very low risk, but they don't necessarily mean no risk. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> low risk means you have to think about whether you've done enough work substantively and you have to think about whether the management team and we have identified any other work that needs to be done on the internal control side to cover off key assertions. So I do think that helping, like, what do you mean no risk? What do you mean by no, and, and really, and oftentimes they, they mean low risk. And there might be some response required and, mm -hmm. and those are some of the issues that sometimes mm -hmm. we get into. Um, perhaps later than we'd like to. Yeah, yeah. And I think often, Maria, that some response is what the team is really trying to get after. They're trying to say, well, within the framework of what I know, if I took this account balance, which is an industry often has inherent risk, but I know at this entity I'm in this low, low risk area, I think I've done enough work, but I'm struggling to take the evidence I've obtained and put it into a bucket of further audit response. Well, I'm struggling to look at the controls and not end up doing 12 controls over this very, very low risk. Mm -hmm. And that then causes the team to say, well, is it a very, very low risk or is it actually no risk? Right. Uh, so I, I'm convinced if we, if we wanted risk assessment to be as powerful as it needs to be, we're going to have to be able to articulate variation of response. And it's going to have to be quite different to the historic lens of doing mm -hmm. more or less samples and having thresholds on substantive procedures that are narrower or broader in, in the work we do. It's gonna, there's, there's something in that that we're gonna have to work out as a profession, and it's a great opportunity for the academic community to help. So what is audit evidence, and how does it present itself in a very different way when you've got this low, low risk we're worried about? Right. And I do think the risk assessment standards would allow for this variability mm -hmm. you're talking mm -hmm. about. So Absolutely. it's not so much the standards as is, Examples. It's is, helping. Yeah, you know, right. What is the, what is what is that variation? Right. Oh, that's great, Philip. We're we're going to shift and talk about those situations where there are deficiencies in the audit procedures performed, which can happen for a number of reasons. But in, in your experience, what's some of the root cause analysis for deficiencies that relate back to risk assessment? Audit procedures are always interesting because they. When, they, when they're deficient, it's normally identified by somebody who's got a, a much, uh, much more advanced ability to look back. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm always cautious <laughs> when we talk about audit deficiencies to remember that it's, it's, a, it's a little easier when you've got six weeks looking back to poke holes in the work that's done there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, when audit deficiencies arise and it relates to risk assessment, most often, it's because the audit team did not articulate the specific risks that they needed to respond to, or they didn't believe in the risks that they had articulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you get the two things that happen. We spoke about the first one earlier. The risk assessment so broadly defined that good faith attempts to address it don't go far enough. 
And then when an auditor doesn't believe in their risk assessment, predictably the audit work that follows mm -hmm. is often less than it should have been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, say a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so I, the, the, the one that, that I think crops up in enough times to at least mention here is, is when an auditor sits and says, well, I have to have a risk related to revenue recognition, and then they go and pick something arbitrary because they can't find something real. And you know, they then run around doing some half-baked procedure. You look at it and say, well, that's never going to get behind an intentional fraud. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the one that continues to, I think, arise when you, when you look across audits is typical manufacturing business, um, broad customer base, delivered product, it's paid for at the, at the transfer, no real return risk, the auditor's struggling to find something, so they put their finger on the air and they say, well, let's call cut off some risk that management would deliberately do, and then they run around and look at 15 shipments either side, and you say, that's interesting, you really think that's what management would, and they don't believe in it? Yeah. That's a pretty typical example. I don't know if you've seen no, others. No, I agree. It's because typical. they're trying to re respond to the presumed risk yeah. of fraud and revenue. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if, if we would take it a step forward, like how could fraud yeah. happen yeah. here? Mm -hmm. How and really think through those schemes, then you would probably have a more tailored approach to how you address that. And risk. something Absolutely. you believe in. So I, I right. really do right. think that, that that could, how yeah. could it happen? And yeah. really, it could happen. Because as soon as yeah. you don't believe in your risk assessment, yeah. the staff don't believe in it either. They observe the lack of attentiveness by the engagement leadership. Uh, they get the sense management doesn't believe in it because um, they can't articulate it. They feel like the work they're doing is not overly persuasive. So those are the two things I see. Overly yeah. broad risk assessment, and then you don't have a precise enough response, or risk assessment you don't believe in, and then the mm -hmm. audit deficiency results if you link risk assessment to the further work. So Mark, talk to us about management's risk assessment. How, how well, as you've looked at these, how well is management doing, doing in doc, not only documenting their risk assessment, but then going through and, and following up? Is the, are the things that they put in place to manage risk actually happening? Is it effective? Are they reporting to the audit committee about, about what's working well, where they, where they have opportunities for improvement? Yeah. So to answer your question on how they document it, I would say it varies all over the board. Uh, as they go through the process of identifying all their risks, the volume issue kicks in. So it's like, how do I manage all this information? Uh, I mentioned the companies that are working with us, they tell us still today, the way they're managing that information is still with Microsoft Office products. Occasionally <laughs> tapping into an ERP system. Mm -hmm. But mostly it's just to archive the risk information. And so I've seen big spreadsheets where they've got all these mm -hmm. columns of themes, and the risk they've identified could be, you know, a hundred or more, and they're like two words, and you're like, okay, how do I understand what this is? <laughs> and then the other side of it is these detailed spreadsheets. What we've heard several times is they, particularly in the earlier phases of really trying to get a more structured process, they'll say, by the time we got through the process of identifying, getting management to think about the big risk issues, prioritizing those, we got our short list of risk, we were exhausted, and we didn't carry it through to yeah. understand the response. Yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of what we talked about on the audit side is a challenge on the management side of they get an inventory of their risk. I would say where they're still challenged is really mapping to the response. And so a lot of them are trying to do things about that. So they're, they're assigning risk owners among the management team to own certain categories of risk. One of their tasks is to now go and get an inventory of, okay, what are we currently doing to manage this risk? And then let's evaluate its effectiveness because we may discover on the management side what we think is going to treat that risk isn't going to do it because I really haven't thought through the risk. So they're beginning now to document that response. Mm -hmm. A lot of your more advanced ones are creating what they call risk profiles where they're doing a risk profile for broader risk themes that then goes to the board. It's a part of the advanced packet going to boards where they'll get they'll take top 10 themes, that risk profile will describe the risk, describe the response, the effectiveness of that response. It's a one pager with the ability to click and go a lot deeper. Mm -hmm. But I think they're really trying to advance when they present that risk information to a board to give them the response. And then they're getting the risk owner to come to board meetings mm 
and walk through that profile. And that's when they can really challenge them on the response yeah. side. So. Great. So it sounds like they're, they've made progress, but they've, they're still a long way to there's go still on the management a lot of side as well. Yes. Excel remains the most effective tool for purposes it was never designed to achieve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll it will saying. be interesting, Dave, I was thinking as Mark was speaking, to, to see the evolution with the cyber risk. Yeah. The ransomware that's out there and have companies really thought through their plan when there's ransomware, how long will they be down? Mm -hmm. You know, all these, like really getting into that, it'll be, mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see as, as, as the months and years uh, follow, uh, to see, because that's yep. not well, if it, anymore, it's yeah, when. It's, and so. it's when, and, and being vague is not gonna be helpful. Right. That's not gonna be right. an effective plan. Yep. Let me shift gears to, to one, one more topic that I wanted to make sure we touched on while we had time with everybody today. And Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you, but interested in anybody's perspective on this. There, there are a lot of changes coming with respect to accounting standards, what I call new gap, but revenue recognition, leasing, credit losses, um, hedging even that's coming up and that sort of thing. There's a lot that um, companies will need to absorb in any one or all of these areas, depending on what their businesses are. How is, and this is where we can get pretty practical because this is, a, this is an issue we're all dealing with this year as companies are working on implementing 606 on revenue recognition and that sort of thing. How is, how is new gap impacting our risk assessment? Is, are, is the adoption of a new accounting standard always a significant risk or what factors will drive that and, and, uh, and, and what's working in terms of the risk assessment around that and where do we need to improve? Um, so I would say that, um, you know, it's, it's of course all going to start with the company's own risk assessment of the new accounting standards and their own ability to understand the new accounting standard requirements and translating that to the sources of potential misstatement in their own organization and getting a handle on where there's going to be, you know, new processes and controls, changes to, you know, their estimations. To, to be able to adopt the new uh, accounting standards. So, um, you know, that, that process is underway already for us. You know, even for those companies who are behind and have not already started to implement changes to their processes and systems, you know, they, they should by now be doing their assessment of the risks. And so we as auditors are already trying to get an understanding of their ability to, to you know, figure out their own population of risks of misstatement. And um, you know, I think that this is challenging as the SEC continues to point out that disclosures about the expected impact of the new standards have been too vague. Um, you know, I think companies, in particular in the in the in the area that in the industry I often work in, which is retail, I think have assumed that this isn't going to be as big of a deal, and so they're a little bit behind, and and that could raise issues with our assessment of their risk assessment. Um, maybe they thought it's been um, you know something that won't impact them, and so they're assuming that the sources of potential misstatement are the same as under current gap, and they haven't yet thought through where things need to be relooked at. Mm -hmm. What else, what are you seeing, Maria, in this area? Well, I think the same, very much yeah. so. And those that are ahead and have a thorough implementation plan and are working through the details uh, will probably be more successful in, in adjusting, if any, uh, for example, their, their controls at, yeah. at the end of yeah. the day. Yeah. So there I'm, are, the, just a second, Philip, there are some industries, and retail is a great example, where, where there may be sort of an assumption that the standard doesn't mm -hmm. have much of an impact. But you also have to look at the disclosure requirements that are in the yeah. standard, which may be very different from mm -hmm. what a company is disclosing today, and their systems currently may not provide the information that they need to provide um, accurate information. Philip, what were you going to add? Um, I think, Dave, as you were describing the list of standards, and there are more coming behind those, it seems to me that we're moving into a period where companies' abilities to acquire new technical knowledge to have defined control processes to analyze the impacts of new gap, to do that on a timely basis. This standard's been available for four years. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the questions before the TRG were finished 10 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think this year, this standard gives auditors a rich opportunity to educate, inform uh, audit committees and management around opportunities for them to improve their processes to adopt new gap, mm 
because we're going to repeat this exercise. Mm -hmm. We're going to repeat it in our private companies, mm -hmm. we're going to repeat it with mm -hmm. new standards. And the sooner companies understand that, the better. I would add to that most of the new accounting standards are increasingly requiring data to be gathered at the transaction level, mm -hmm. whether it's for disclosures or for variation and defense of recognition and measurement. Um, the standard setting process is starting to really drill down to this transaction, I need these pieces of information mm -hmm. in order to uh, record, report, and disclose what's required by GAAP. Yeah. The, the only great. other thing that yeah. occurred to me is back to management and how they're thinking about it. We have not seen so much change on the accounting side in a generation is what right, I say. Right. And so companies as well, yeah. the people that probably have helped with a lot of the change, maybe during Sarbanes-Oxley, um, are they still around? Like, who, who knows how to go through large-scale <laughs> implementations? Oh, by the way, they're coming right after one right, another, right? right? Mm -hmm. They could be impacting you. So uh, do you have the right group of people that can really help the company navigate what's coming? Have so you dusted your new gap controls off the shelf and given them a yeah. polish yeah. Yeah. yeah, are people fit and ready to what's right. coming? I mean, all well, these things. Right. Right. And, and how many companies are, are adopting the revenue recognition standards using spreadsheets, mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. that they've got to change systems yeah. so they'll have even more internal control changes in the future? Yeah, and believe but, me, the group audit factors in this area, where you have oh, a yes. distributed <laughs> ledger system and distributed yep. entities, your problems for reporters go up exponentially. Yeah. So we wanted to save time for questions with you all, and, the, and so we're at that point in time, and we have microphones which we'd ask you to use so everybody can hear you ask a question. But do, we've got Zovana. I'm, I'm not surprised you're first. <laughs> Sorry. Is it on? Oh, I guess it is. So I'd like to follow up on Philip's point about um, revenue recognition as a presumed fraud risk. Uh, I was somewhat horrified. I, Mark and I were on the task force that helped draft SAS 99, <laughs> and I was somewhat <laughs> horrified. We actually intended that if it wasn't a fraud risk, it could be documented as so. I, 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 I'm really surprised that it sounds like it's become um, a de facto fraud risk that uh, teams don't necessarily believe in. So my question is, how often is it the case that, that teams are able to identify it as not being a fraud risk, does that occur? Is it being accepted in the inspection process? Um, uh, or do we have an unintended consequence here? Great. Well, you know, Philip, it's always, it's always, it's, other it's, it's always yeah. dangerous yeah. when you pick an example. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good one. Uh, it's a good example yeah. because yeah. it happens, and it's one <laughs> to Dave's question at the time, where people don't believe in the response. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I think it's become very difficult for auditors to explain overcoming presumed fraud risks when it's the last fraud risk they have left on their list. So I think that may be some of it. Um, it's certainly challenging. Uh, I, I think we've had challenges in inspection processes. We've had challenges within uh, engagement teams working through what those fraud risk responses need to be. I'm not sure if you've seen some of the same. Well, I, I, oh, I would add, yeah. I think that, um, you know, when the risk assessment standards first came out, I think that there was a tendency of our audit professionals to feel as though they need to identify a baseline number of risks, of, of significant risks, including fraud risks, and that demonstrated that they were skeptical auditors and that they were exercising professional, you know, caution about where the risks might lie. And I think it took us a little while for us to realize um, you know, to Philip's point that people weren't believing in their conclusions because then they were left trying to defend the less work that they did over that risk because they were saying, well, that really isn't a risk for this organization and here's why. And that, that is a very sorry defense when, you know, you've defined it a risk yourself. So I, I think we have started to see a movement away from defining revenue as a rebuttable presum presumed fraud risk on you know, in certain organizations that it, it just, it would be very difficult for that opportunity to commit fraud to happen. And I think that that has held up in inspections when that's yeah. the case, provided the team has done a good job of, of explaining the rationale, which we continue to encourage teams to do. And we talked earlier, Zovana, about just the, those risks that, 
where you, through the process, conclude there's no reasonable risk of a material misstatement, the importance of documenting that professional judgment. The same thing is true here, that, that you don't, it can't just be a two-sentence tick mark. It's got to, it's got to really describe why, why, what you considered and why you concluded that there wasn't a reasonable fraud risk that would create a material misstatement. Yep. Ira, oh, uh, go, sorry, you've got one back behind you first. I, I was going to ask you about, um, in, in maybe more the attest, risk assessment and more the attestation audits, particularly in the compliance portion, say in the broker-dealer uh, mm -hmm. audits, and how that works and how that interacts with materiality. Because I can see it, you know, we see it in the financial audit pretty clearly, but what about in these compliance audits or compliance-based audits? How does, how does materiality fit in and how, how do the auditors do their risk assessment? Great. Anybody want to volunteer? Nobody's jumping in on that. I will, I will, I will tell you that, the, that it's generally a very specialized area of auditing to the extent that there are um, similarities in, in how organizations work, uh, whether it's in broker-dealers or investment management or retail or other industries. We'll generally work together to provide engagement teams guidance on, on things to consider, not telling them what the risks are, but to consider when evaluating those risks. and. Um, and, and then they will go through and document their risk assessments similar to what we do in, in each of these cases. Setting materiality is a challenge in those organizations because of the way they generally, the, the way they earn commission revenue and, and that, that often they're, they're not intended to be organizations that generate a lot of profit before tax. So that is a, that's an area of challenge. But, um, but clearly we, you know, we work with that and, and use that materiality to, to inform our risk assessment. I think we also, in a compliance audit, start thinking about the compliance objectives. So a lot of a compliance audit tends more towards process and control evidence through the lens of completed transactions. And, and you're worrying about safeguarding of assets, compliance with regulatory requirements, uh, documented processes and repeats. And that kind of gives the compliance audit a different complexion to the financial statement audit. It may not be anchored on a quantitative measure right. because right, right. of the compliance elements that need right. to be satisfied. And how do you satisfy those yeah. elements? Great. Ira, let's go to you. And this may be the last question. We'll see what the time is. So. Uh -oh. Better no, make it a real good That was not a commentary on your question, by the way. <laughs> well, first off, let me just uh, thank the panel for what I think is really an excellent discussion. I came with high expectations and they were more than met. I do have, a, have an observation. One of the elements of the discussion that was most salient to me was how in today's world, uh, risks that arise in a company's operations can spill over to the financial statements and the financial reporting domain. And what I'd like to do is to get the, in particular, the practice members of the panel to share with us sort of a best practice idea rather than focusing on, on the negative. When that has happened in one of your engagements, what have been the best examples of the adjustments to the audit program and the audit evidence that was ultimately collected to address those risks? So I'll, I'll start with an example of, of a company that I think did, did a nice job. So they would go through their risk assessment process and show the results. And, and the evolution of that year after year was that with curiosity and asking, well, not only what are, what are the results, but what questions were you asking? Who were you meeting with within the organization? And why were you meeting with these folks, right? Um, and them sharing that with you, including the notes as to what people were saying and how they were starting to think about risk, was very insightful as, as we thought about you know, how, to, how to go about our own risk assessment. So what comes of it is then you could say, I wonder given this, how these risks are evolving, whether you should start to think about having a different process or set of controls related to this business that maybe was less mature but it's coming into maturity as compared to the other ones that are more mature. So to me, that company, number one, kudos for their openness, but also their willingness to, to start to you know, go A and, A, A and B go together to equal C. So. Yeah, I, I would build on that. Yeah. One of my best client experiences in this realm was a client who actually involved the auditors in attending and observing their three risk sessions a year. They had a risk discovery session, they had a risk waiting and response session, um, and then they had a retrospective. And by being 
engaged to be present during that process, we were able to hear and take some risks. And this was a, a commodity-driven business. Uh, they had some environmental exposures. Uh, those environmental exposures were being discovered through the operations, not through the financial reporting side. Uh, they were fairly significant complexes that were being dealt with. We were able to get ahead of that quite early in the client's audit cycle, uh, bring in some specialists outside which were critical to the evaluation, have them lay out their process, respond to their process in our risk assessment, which allowed the company to build a degree of confidence that what they were about to do would actually be useful for the audits as well as their purposes, uh, and then evaluate the evidence that resulted. So that was a pretty neat, because we were along the road for the journey, we weren't discovering at the back end something which had a very, very material financial impact. Great, well I'm gonna take this opportunity to thank all of the panelists for what they uh, shared with us today. Cindy, you come on up, but please thank our panelists for sharing today.